good? Really good? It's you and me. Subcommittee will come to order. Ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare recess during today's hearing without objection, so ordered. Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's hearing on short uh, sea shipping. I to apologize to our witnesses. Um, the members have been detained by votes on the House floor, which just concluded moments ago. So we apologize for keeping you all waiting. It was uh, unavoidable, unfortunately. So on March 6th, the subcommittee examined the state of the maritime industry. In that hearing, the maritime administrator and industry representatives repeated a common message. When it comes to growing the American maritime industry, cargo is king. Now, if you've driven on uh, I-95 recently, you know full well that there's an excess of cargo and therefore traffic on our roads. By 2045, truck freight volume is expected to grow by 43%, which, without major infrastructure improvements, will further clog our roads and highways. This increased traffic would be significantly alleviated if we shifted cargo to our waterways through short sea shipping. Short sea shipping is the waterborne transportation of commercial freight between domestic ports through inland and coastal waterways. While our friends in Europe have placed short sea shipping at the center of their transportation policies, moving over 40% of all European freight on oceans and inland rivers, we have failed to leverage our existing programs to provide additional support for our domestic shipping industry. An invigorated short sea shipping industry would not only increase the state of good repair of the US roads and bridges by reducing maintenance costs from wear and tear and improve air quality and admissions, but it would also help to address the critical shortage in our merchant mariner workforce. Administrator Busby and other government officials have repeatedly stated that we have 1,800 fewer mariners than what is needed to address America's sea lift needs. That gap would quickly begin to close if we fully utilized America's marine highway and began shipping cargo on coastwise ships. In order to rigorously promote short sea shipping, we must develop a national multimodal transportation and infrastructure plan that prominently features maritime transportation. The Maritime Administration claims to be working to maintain the health of the merchant marine, yet in the five years since Congress tasked MARAD with the development of a comprehensive maritime strategy, we have seen little movement to create a comprehensive plan to promote short sea shipping. So I look forward to hearing from Admiral Busby on the status of that strategy, particularly as it pertains to short sea shipping. I also look forward to hearing from our civilian panel on the benefits of short sea shipping, the status of projects that currently exist, and what Congress and the administration can be doing to advance the use of marine highways. Now I'd like to call on the ranking member, uh, Mr. Gibbs, for his opening remarks. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. Increased use of waterborne transportation of commercial freight between domestic U.S. ports, short sea shipping could expand the limited and increasingly crowded freight transportation capacity of the nation's rail and road system without the need for large additional public investments. Historically, freight has been moved by water in the United States, and a large portion of bulk shipments still move by water. Increased availability of trains and trucks have reduced the usage of water transportation for movement of higher value freight. Water is far and away the most fuel efficient way to move freight, but since it is geographically confined by where there is water, it is limited in its ability to get goods to the ultimate destination the last mile problem, and every loading, unloading, and reloading of freight adds expense and time delays. Increased freight volumes, limited dollars to invest in new infrastructure, increased road congestion, and increased interest in reducing air emissions have also been cited in recent years as reasons that short sea shipping should be examined as an alternative source of added transportation capacity. However, movement of container freight on America's waterways has not increased. The reasons given include the configuration of large ports to handle large vessels, the reluctance of freight shippers to move to new modes of transportation, and the difficulty for potential shipbuilders to secure financing for new ship construction if they do not have freight contracts in place to prove that they can pay off the vessel's mortgages. In 2007, Congress established a short sea transportation program to promote the domestic transportation of freight by water. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today about whether that program has worked and what additional public or private actions can be taken to promote such transportation. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the hearing today, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Thank the gentleman, and I'd like to welcome the witness on our first panel, Rear Admiral Mark H. Busby, Administrator of the Maritime Administration. Uh, thank you for being here today, sir. Look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witness's full statement will be included in the record. Um, since your written testimony has been made part of the record, sir, the subcommittee requests 
that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Thank you for being here. You may proceed. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify this afternoon on the Maritime Administration's efforts to uh, foster, promote, and develop short sea shipping through America's Maritime Highway Program. The Marine Highway System consists of our nation's navigable waterways, including rivers, bays, channels, the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Seaway System, coastal and open ocean routes. As established by Congress, America's Marine Highway Program aims to reduce road congestion, cut emissions, conserve energy, improve safety, and reduce landside infrastructure costs. Marine transport of goods offers a safe and efficient op option for shippers. One study estimates that in 2014, congestion on our roads, bridges, railways, and imports cost the United States as much as 160 billion, trucks accounting for 28 billion of this cost. Overall, the volume of imports and exports transported by our freight system is expected to more than double over the next 30 years. This will have an implication for ports, which handle approximately 70% of America's international trade by volume. Expanding existing or establishing new marine highway services on commercially navigable waterways is a cost-effective way to meet some of our freight transportation needs and relieve landside congestion. America's Marine Highway Program designates routes and projects and provides grant funding. As of this month, DOT has designated 25 marine highway routes comprising a significant portion of our navigable waterways. A semi-annual call for projects helps to identify concepts for new or expansion of existing marine highway services that have the potential to offer public benefits and long-term sustainability without long-term financial support from the federal government. To date, DOT has awarded 24 million in competitive marine highway grants supporting at least six new and two existing marine highway services. America's Marine Highway Program grant-funded services moved 35,215 20-foot equivalent units, or TEUs, in fiscal year 16 by water, saving an estimated 1.5 million in road maintenance and congestion costs. These savings were from the M64 Express Marine Highway Service running between Hampton Roads and Richmond, Virginia, the only grant-funded marine highway service operating in the United States at that time. In fiscal year 17, savings calculations were estimated at 3.6 million and increased to more than 4.9 million in fiscal year 18, a result of a new Baton Rouge to New Orleans service and the New York Cross Harbor service. While the numbers may be small relative to the initial grant, the equipment will operate for decades in most cases and the reductions in infrastructure damage, emissions, and fatalities will be felt for years. We are considering specific ways the Maritime Administration can maximize America's marine highway benefits, particularly using our marine highways to move federal cargo. We are also exploring partnerships with the EPA's Smart Way program and other such programs to tout the efficiencies of utilizing the marine highway system. Finally, the Maritime Administration has been proactive in engaging with local and regional officials and private entrepreneurs in analyzing specific logistical challenges where a waterborne solution may offer the best and most sustainable approach. We are proud of the effect that the America's Maritime Highway Program has had in support of the Jones Act and are excited about the momentum it is building in such a short period of time, but we are not done. We believe that continued expansion of the use of marine highways can greatly benefit the marine industry generally while reducing road traffic and emissions and landside infrastructure costs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon, and I look forward to your questions. Thank the gentleman. We'll now proceed to questions. I will be observing a five-minute rule this afternoon. I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Admiral Busby, um, please help us understand what uh, the principal barriers are uh, to marine highway development. And um, please also comment on when the Congress can expect uh, 
see the National Maritime Strategy since we've been waiting for some time on that document and that strategy, and would you also refer to the role that short sea shipping would play in such a strategy? Yes, sir, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll address that strategy piece first. Uh, as you know, Congress has uh, given us now an extension till the, till the uh, 13th of February of next year, 2020, um, and I fully expect that we will uh, present the strategy uh, within that uh, timeline, sir. It's uh, currently in interagency uh, coordination, and uh, I'll be standing by to uh, get it and move it forward to you, sir. What can you tell us about it, sir? Give us a preview of coming attractions. Uh, well, it's... Uh, don't it, ruin the ending. Yeah, I, don't found, want, I, don't any, I don't want any spoilers, but... <laughs> well, I can surely give, after six years, we've got to have some thoughts on, on what we're doing, right? I, I can tell you this. Foundationally, it's built on, on, the, uh, on the Merchant Marine Act of 36, the, uh, the Jones Act, uh, cargo preference. It's built on those things that uh, you know, have kept the Merchant Marine alive and breathing, uh, quite frankly. So... Uh, so that's, that's the basis of it. Uh, I think that you will see that uh, short sea shipping and port development and port uh, modernization play a key role, recognizing that our ports are our economic gateways to this country. Majority of our goods flow through those ports and then are distributed uh, through uh, rail, through highways, and hopefully increasingly through maritime highways. Uh, so that'll be a key element of that, making sure we continue to modernize that, that flow. And then, and of course, uh, preparing the workforce for the future. Uh, that's a very key element of the strategy to make sure that we're modernizing and bringing enough people in, which is why the uh, National Maritime Security Multi-Mission Vessel Program is a very key element of that. So while you haven't seen it yet, a lot of the things that we're doing right now, you will recognize in that strategy when you see it, where you haven't stopped waiting that to be approved to move forward. And short sea shipping? Short sea shipping, the, the barriers I get, I think that uh, are keeping us from really surging ahead thus far, uh, I would say number one is probably awareness, uh, education uh, of, uh, of shippers, that there are these alternate means. Uh, and, it, and quite frankly, it's understanding the business case uh, to be made or that, that exists to move things by water. Uh, that takes a little digging into and understanding, uh, especially when you're just used to throwing it in the back of a truck or throwing it on a rail car, uh, understanding that there are other ways to move it, that you know, there may be trade-offs in, in time or uh, you know, uh, other certain aspects of it, but in the end it can have significant impacts in terms of the environment, in terms of uh, savings due to road wear and everything else. What are the Europeans doing that we're not? Sorry? What are the Europeans doing that we're not? Uh, well, you know, they have, they've had a, uh, they have not um, benefited from the road network and the rail network that we have. Uh, you know, we've been very blessed in this country and we have such an extensive road network that has enabled trucking really to, to take the place of uh, what rivers do uh, in Europe. So we, we kind of got spoiled in that respect. When you think back, rivers, uh, our river system, and our coastal system, that's how America moved goods in the beginning before we had roads, before we had railroads, that's how it all happened. We moved away from that because we've got so darn good with our rail system and our road system, both of which are becoming overtaxed now. So, you know, the, our waterways are our one artery where we still have a lot of capacity to grow into. And if we double our, our um, you know, cargo, as we say, we think we're going to do over the next 30 years, we won't have any choice. We will have to go into the waterways. Mr. Gibbs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral, for being here. Um, some of the obstacles, I know that the shipping community has suggested that the, the harbor maintenance fee, the harbor maintenance trust fund, uh, the law, any cargo that uh, is imported from Canada or between U.S. ports, there's the valerium tax for harbor maintenance trust fund. Um, do you know how much uh, is raised annually as a result between the domestic shipments? I, I don't have the, the number right at the tip of my tongue, but you know that that is a an issue. Is you know, when you're doing that sort of domestic shipping, you end up paying twice. And, do, uh, do you think it's a, enough that it's a disincentive? Do you you know that uh, um, is a disincentive to increase short um, sea shipping? 
it, it certainly is a factor. Like every form of transportation has cost factors that have to be factored in. This is one uh, that has to be factored in. I just raise this, I just, because some in the shipping community are raising it, and, and uh, uh, at least from the Canadian and, and uh, uh, domestic ports to port. Right. Um, you know, I maybe talked about this in the questions from the chairman, but um, is there anything the federal government could do to really try to jumpstart uh, the short sea shipping? You know, you talked, I think you talked a little bit about infrastructure. Um, I guess I'm just trying to think, uh, you know, I, this is really a private sector thing. Um, and uh, there's challenges, there's obstacles for them wanting to do that. Uh, some of that's, you know, getting financing for building new ships. Um, uh, just reluctance from shippers because there's competition between other modes of transportation. Um, do you see anything specifically that uh, the federal government should be doing to maybe help give confidence to the shippers to, to want to uh, increase our assets, our capabilities? Well, I, I think this program is, you know, a, a great uh, impetus to try and do that because it's not just the fact that we are designating projects and providing grants for those designated projects, which is an incentive. But I think um, the education piece, as I mentioned before, is really important. It's, it's just not well known, it's just not well appreciated, I think, by most shippers and many carriers that this alternate uh, means exists and it, and it can be uh, beneficial uh, to, to their business. At the end of the day, it comes down to a business case. Yeah. You know, people moving goods around the business case has to be there in order to do that. You know, the reliability has to be there. Cost-wise, it has to work. Schedule-wise, it has to work. In some areas, marine highways work like a champ. Yep. You know, we have, you know, seven very good, strong uh, programs that are out there working where all of those pieces fit in. Uh, but, you know, so that's discovery. People figured that out. Uh, so the, more of that discovery has to occur. Uh, so I think I think uh, most of the shipping in the short sea maritime is, is really bulk commodities, for better lack of a better word. Right. Uh, maybe not so much in the containers. Right. And and this program specifically doesn't address bulk because bulk is moving pretty well. This this program was developed to move uh, address containers and later on break bulk. What was that last part? Break bulk and you know, okay. palletized so uh, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. goods. Which you know, in some areas, um, I think if you look at New York, if you look at the New York area itself, uh, you know, a lot of the users of goods in New York City or the area don't need a 20-foot TEU uh, worth of stuff. They need a pallet. So, to the extent that you can use the harbor to move things around instead of on a truck in a small vessel or something, move a pallet sized and then move it through the streets. I mean, I think there's potential there. Uh, that, that could be exploited, and I know there are entrepreneurs out there that are looking at just that kind of a thing. So they're, you know, it's people thinking beyond the normal. Yeah, we're stuck with this size. This is all we got. Um, you know, if they can come think outside, I guess if they can think outside the box of uh, and satisfy what the market's, de you know, demanding or asking. And I think you just gave an example of that. Yeah, I mean, there's there are other pr uh, projects around that I think have great, uh, great promise. Uh, they just need to kind of be fully baked, yet they're, they're conceptual in many cases. They just have to work through that business case and then they'll be ready to go. Okay. Thank you, I yield back. Thank the gentleman, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Busby, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your testimony. You mentioned the link between short sea shipping, it's very hard to say quickly, <laughs> um, and the Jones Act. Uh, obviously, the Jones Act is always the subject of debate. What do you think the biggest misconception out there about the Jones Act is? If you could sort of talk to the American people about why the Jones Act is important and correct sort of some of the misconceptions, what, what, would, what is at the top of that list? Uh, well, these days it's getting to be that the Jones Act is a root of all evil, that <laughs> everything that's wrong is, is the fault of the Jones Act, uh, and that everything that costs more is a result of the Jones Act. Mm -hmm. And that's just not borne out in the facts. You know, when you, when you look at uh, the detriment that would be caused to this nation uh, by the Jones Act going away in terms of impact of shipbuilding and ship repair for the 40,000 vessels that are Jones Act vessels that all 
get built and repaired in U.S. Uh, shipyards. So the number of uh, people that are employed, the American mariners that are employed, that, oh, by the way, on, on some of the larger Jones Act ships I depend upon uh, to help crew up our sea lift vessels, they would go away. Uh, to just the people that are pushing, uh, you know, uh, transiting our waterways, American citizens that are a de facto layer of security for our nation. They're out there every day. They know what normal looks like. If they see something wrong, they're going to say something wrong. I don't think we could believe that would ever happen with a foreigner uh, pushing, uh, you know, goods up and down our internal waterways. And why would we want to turn our internal commerce over to a foreigner to control? Um, uh, it, it just it blows my mind. So, um, uh, you know, I think for all of those reasons, uh, you know, it's it's absolutely critical. I appreciate that. Uh, and you mentioned in your testimony that, that congestion, um, we have congestion on our roadways and therefore we have an advantage when it comes to maximizing our maritime shipping lanes. Can you also speak about the importance of ice breaking for keeping maritime shipping lanes open and, and our current ice breaking capacity on the Great Lakes? Uh, well, obviously ice breaking uh, falls into the purview of the Coast Guard and, uh, you know, as we heard the Commandant uh, last time he and I were here uh, speak, um, you know, he, he believes he has a plan for the Great Lakes, at least anyway. Um, but, uh, and he needs obviously some help in the, in the high latitudes with uh, our new polar security cutters. But um, clearly, especially on those cold winters, um, ice breaking ca capacity on the upper reaches of the rivers and the Great Lakes toward the end of the seasons is, is really vital to ensuring that flow of, uh, of goods and that flow of commerce. On those years where we have uh, heavy freeze and heavy icing on the upper Mississippi, it uh, wreaks havoc. Uh, and even up on the upper uh, upper Hudson, uh, we have heavy ice years, uh, it wreaks havoc. So I know the Coast Guard has, uh, you know, a lot of inland cutters, 140 footers that they uh, task pretty heavily, um, uh, but they all are vital part of the entire uh, marine highway system, absolutely. Thank you, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen, Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Chairman Maloney, and thank you, Admiral, for being here today. Short sea shipping, <laughs> especially along our nation's rivers, is vitally important in my district in West Virginia. The Huntington Tri-State Port is one of the largest inland water ports. It was the largest till Cincinnati got dredged, if I remember correctly. But it ships over 80 million tons of cargo every year. That's 80 million tons of natural resources reaching domestic and foreign markets, creating jobs and driving our economy. Our waterways are essential for efficiently shipping our products and staying competitive in the global markets. This is a little bit like Congressman Gibbs' question, but what steps can Congress take to promote maritime careers for hardworking Americans? Uh, well, you know, we are, uh, thank you for the question, and it's a great one because it really speaks to the workforce issue, which is a, which is a big focus of mine. And traditionally, MARAD has really focused at the state maritime academies and Kings Point, our federal maritime academy. Um, we are increasingly looking lower now. We're looking at uh, deeper into our educational system down to the high school level. Uh, maritime focused high schools at uh, community colleges. We're getting ready to uh, fire off the uh, domestic center of maritime excellence program. Uh, we'll be coming out with uh, the advertisement for that uh, for comment here very shortly. But we really see that as the generator of, uh, of a maritime workforce, especially for the inland uh, sector, Jones Act sector, uh, becoming so much more important in the future as we see growth on our maritime highways. We need to kind of get ahead of that, if you will. And I think through uh, increased focus in our, uh, uh, at our high school level, and I've asked all of my state maritime academy presidents to reach out in their regions to start interfacing with those folks, to start um, you know, getting it known that maritime education and maritime careers, both ashore uh, and afloat, are really gonna be vital to our nation, and they're good paying jobs. You'll be able to raise a family on them. 
I'm glad to hear you say that because there's much more focus on career and technical happening now. And so I think that would be wonderful. What are the biggest regulatory burdens or unfair taxes imposed on maritime shipping industry that keep it from competing with trucking and rail? Well, we, we, we talked about the harbor maintenance tax and the fact that that's, that's kind of a double jeopardy uh, thing. Um, you know, that has to probably ultimately be addressed at some point. Um, I'm not sure how, how that's going to go. It's, uh, 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 you know, but that, that has been raised repeatedly as, a, as an issue. Uh, we hear from, from industry. Uh, it's, it's been made to work in some places, uh, but it, it, uh, depending on the market, depending on the commodity, depending on the circumstances, it can be uh, more of a challenge to keep um, uh, those programs moving forward. Um, <clears throat> I think that's probably the, the, biggest, okay. the biggest thing. The Maritime Highway System includes the section of the Ohio River that connects my district to the rest of the country. How has the program expanded since its enactment, and how can Congress continue to help the Maritime Administration promote maritime highways? Uh, we've, we've designated 25 uh, marine highway routes, and that, that really covers most of the navigable waterways. We've we may have a couple yet to go, but I think we've pretty much, I think we have one that's under consideration actually right now by the Secretary. Uh, but we've done a pretty good job, I think, of covering the navigable uh, waters. But, you know, there may be others, and, uh, you know, we'll certainly uh, look for um, uh, you know, nominations of those designations because that's the basis of the program. You have to have the highway in order to support the, pro the project. Uh, so once the, the, the highway is there, the project can then go forward. And that project designation then enables it to be considered for grant funding uh, based on the, the merits of the, of the program. And, um, you know, I think that will continue to grow. I mean, we see every year we see more uh, programs being requested for designation, and we're able to then consider more for grants. Uh, and that's, you know, we, we can spread uh, the funding that we get uh, a little bit broader every year. Uh, with the broader grants, with the broader uh, programs. Okay, thank you. Are the Navy and the Coast Guard continuing to find more effective ways to see that their ship dri drivers are eligible to receive merchant mariner credentials after they leave the service? Uh, well, of course, we have the uh, military to mariner program, which uh, uh, we uh, continue to push forward on. Of course, the president uh, passed the uh, executive order uh, a couple of months back that, uh, that helped that process along. Uh, we are, I know I can speak for the Navy, because uh, my old service, uh, that they have uh, done uh, a lot of effort to try and start cataloging the sea time uh, and the actual uh, coursework that's done during the course of an officer's career in order to make that transition if they show choose to do it. Uh, much easier than it was uh, just even a couple of years ago. So answer your question, yes, uh, we are moving uh, well in that direction. We will get some people to transition over. Unfortunately, most of the people that leave the Navy do so because they don't like uh, the family separation and coming into this line of work, you get a little bit more of that. But uh, we, do, we do get uh, Naval officers and Coast Guard officers that, uh, and Army officers for that matter that enjoy coming over in the Merchant Marine. Okay, thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you, lady. Um, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, first, uh, let me compliment you, uh, Mr. Chairman Maloney, for holding this hearing. Uh, it's a very, very important step along the way to maintaining and enhancing our maritime industry. Admiral, I missed your opening statement been busily trying to catch up and reading it, but I do want to thank you for your attention to the uh, issues of maritime, the work that you did with us on the uh, NDAA and the issues there uh, moves it forward and hopefully we'll be able to expand uh, the um, maritime support for, the, uh, for our military. Um, investing in our nation's inland and coastal waterways will always reduce a roadway congestion and fatalities. The short sea shipping uh, can be competitive, but it needs help. Uh, there are many different pieces to this, 
Army Corps of Engineers dredging programs or not, uh, docks and the like that are uh, not exactly or even close designed for the kind of infrastructure necessary for short sea, which is a whole lot different than across the ocean, um, ships and uh, the infrastructure needed for that. Um, it's interesting that the uh, dredging issue uh, in my district becomes very important. And it's not just for um, freight, but also for moving people. Uh, the ferry system in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area sometimes doesn't work because the ferries can't even get to the dock. And so that brings us to the Army Corps of Engineers and their budget and the allocation of, of their funds. Um, also, I know this, uh, the intersection or the in exchange between Interstate 80 and 680 and um, in my district, Fairfield area is probably going to be a multi-billion dollar interchange when it's finished. I guess I'm pleased that we provided some seven million dollars for uh, short sea shipping, which is some small, small fraction of the billions that will be spent on one interchange, largely because of the truck traffic coming out of this San Francisco Bay Area. In any case, just a couple of questions. Um, how do we use, make better use of the um, taxes that are presently collected, and how do, and is it necessary for us to find a way of avoiding the double taxation that will occur in short sea shipping? Could you go into that in a little detail? Uh, I, to the extent I can, yes, sir. Um, you know, as we've sort of discussed here um, earlier, that's that has been long been an issue in uh, in short sea shipping, and that is the kind of the double jeopardy for harbor maintenance tax uh, that it gets uh, tagged uh, twice. Um, this is something that it comes to us, and uh, your earlier testimony. Once again, I apologize for missing. Uh, it should be the foundation for a. Um, an amendment to our current tax law so that we don't double tax, so that we provide, uh, eliminate this financial disincentive. Also, I'm going to bring your attention, which I suspect you know, there's a uh, very strong incentive to use the port of Vancouver rather than the ports in Seattle because of that very same tax. So when that uh, train arrives in the Midwest from Vancouver, maybe that tax ought to apply when it crosses the border. I don't think the MCA took that up, but it is an issue that uh, harms the uh, industry on the West Coast. Um, what would it, what's it going to take here? Is it going to take direct uh, subsidies to the shipper? Does it take better infrastructure? Where would you suspect we spend the next uh, 7 million or 20 or 21 million? In terms of marine highways? Yes. Specific, specifically? Um, well, I, th I think I I'm, I'm always siding on the entrepreneurial sort of spirit um, in, in this country. Just about all of these projects you know, that are up and running now, seven that are running and the many, many 25 that are approved and probably another 30 that are in the queue um, are all somebody's brainchild. You know, they all looked at looked at a situation and said, that makes more sense to move it by water. And now figuring out the, the business case to make that happen, uh, you know, it takes a while to do it. It doesn't work in every case, but there have been, uh, you know, we have great examples of where it makes great sense. Some places should not probably ship by water. It just doesn't work. But I think increasingly as we see the costs mounting and the you know, the, the well, is it time. possible for the construction of the vessels themselves? We've had programs in the past that supported the construction of vessels. Is that a good place to invest? Yeah, you know, uh, building Jones Act vessels of the size that we're talking about here, tugs and barges for the most part, um, you know, that's not really an issue. People, the rest of the world doesn't build tugs and barges as well as we do for the cost that we do. We're very competitive. Our shipbuilding industry is very competitive in tug and barges. So uh, having to you know, provide a lot of subsidy, building subsidies, I don't know that that's specifically the answer. Um, I, you know, I, I certainly in the international side, it, it, it's- Just a uh, couple of, uh, one final point in the, and 
Um, rebuilding our maritime industry requires specific legislative support for the industry. Uh, next week, we will be introducing the uh, Energizing the American Shipbuilding Industry. We appreciate your support for that and the members of many of the folks that are here on the dais uh, for their support and folks in the audience. Uh, that will provide at least many of the jobs and much of the industrial uh, construction of the ships. So we'll be working on that, and it may be fit into this. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and uh, seeing no further member questions, uh, I know we've kept, kept you longer than anticipated already, Admiral Busby. We do have your written testimony for the record. We appreciate very much uh, those submissions as we lay the necessary predicate for some of the good work we want to do as a committee in this area. Um, work that without today's hearing would not be possible under the new House rules. So we appreciate very much your participation. It does help us in our work. I'd like to move to the second panel if that's possible. And thank you very much, Admiral. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. While our witnesses are uh, taking the table, I'll go ahead and begin to introduce them. Um, we're lucky to be joined today by Mr. John Nass, Chief Executive Officer of the Maine Port Authority, uh, Mr. James Weekly, President of the Lake Carriers Associations, and Mr. Larry Willis, President of the Transportation Trades Department, um, the AFL-CIO. Thank you all for being here today. We look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. As for the previous panel, since we have your written testimony uh, and it has been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Um, Mr. Uh, Nash, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just recommend to the witnesses, you can pull that box as close to you as, as needed. It does move. And if you speak into the microphone, it helps our stenographer and the folks uh, watching it. Uh, on TV, thanks. Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, and members of the Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. My name is Jonathan Nass, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Maine Port Authority. Thank you for inviting me to speak today on the exciting topic of short sea shipping. The Maine Port Authority is a quasi-governmental entity tasked with improving Maine's economy by developing and promoting infrastructure that moves freight domestically and internationally. Maine has a long history of living from and by the sea. If you drive Route 1 along Maine's coast, you will encounter mansions sea captains built over several hundred years in virtually every town you cross through. These once grand houses are monuments of the prosperity once enjoyed from a thriving coastal freight transportation network. Unfortunately today, many are in disrepair and suggest a time past and many lost opportunities over the last 50 years. The Maine Port Authority and many others are currently working to revitalize that maritime shipping heritage. We recently developed a brownfield in the city of Portland into, an, into the International Marine Terminal, a container terminal that in just five years has gone from a derelict abandoned eyesore to a vibrant international logistical multimodal hub connecting Maine to the world. We, we're very proud to note that we've had annual growth in volume of over 20 to 30% every year. I believe what we can build on that success by connecting northern New England domestically to ports to our south through establishing water service paralleling the congested I-95 highway system on the east coast. For those of us that live in port cities, moving freight by water is instinct, but it needs to become intuitive for others as well, especially those who set transportation policy. One only needs to sit for a few frustrating hours in Boston or Beltway traffic to appreciate the value of alternative transportation of freight. Moving freight from highway to seaway will improve commerce, decrease air pollution, and reduce fuel consumption traffic, and traffic congestion in our largest cities. I'm certainly not the first to suggest that the United States have an, has an infrastructure problem. There's no denying it. In maritime terms, the nation's surface transportation infrastructure is like a vessel taking on water, fast. 
Fortunately, fixing our transportation network is not a political issue. Democrats and Republicans all agree it's broken. Rather, it is a policy issue. How will we as a nation fix it? How can we help you as Congress to address it? The first step in saving a leaking ship is to, a sinking ship is to plug the leaks. The infrastructure policy debate usually centers around one question. Where will the funding come from to rebuild Americans, America's highways? But there's more to the transportation equation than highways. As with any fixed asset, there's also a matter of depreciation and use. If we can reduce the cost of the highway system, reduce the rate of depreciation, and reduce the rate of growth of trucks on our highways, then we're starting to plug the leaks. By not making alternative freight transportation system a national priority, especially short sea shipping alternatives, I believe that we are misusing our surface transportation network. We're missing a win-win opportunity to both stop the leaks in the highway infrastructure while fostering a revitalized waterway eco economy nationally. What if we can establish a well-utilized marine highway as functional as roads and bridges but without the cost of pavement and steel, without potholes, without traffic jams, a system where at least some long-haul freight bypasses the heavily congested urban areas? That's exactly what the Maritime Administration's Marine Highway is designed to do, and it should be a top priority when fixing the entire system. Since the Eisenhower administration, the United States has focused on a network of expensive fixed transportation assets. Uh, the problem is that it's constant patching, lost time, money, road rage, accidents, but we've ignored a great opportunity. In 2010, Secretary Ray LaHood designated the New England Highway System as part of the National Marine Highway System. Part of that project was the designing of an articulated barge uh, that is Jones Act compliant, yet uh, uh, is 40% uh, CapEx and 40% OpEx of a uh, comparable uh, marine vessel. We've also become a member of the uh, North Atlantic Marine Highway Alliance. This effort, funded by the Maritime Administration and managed by New York City Economic Development, uh, includes parties from the Chesapeake to Maine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we recently hosted a meeting that brought uh, freight owners uh, together with port owners and shippers in Maine, and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions on that interesting discussion. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that, Mr. Nass. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Weekly, you may proceed. Thank you. I represent 13 American companies operating 46 U.S. flag vessels on the Great Lakes. We carry the raw materials that drive the nation's economy, iron ore, for limestone, iron ore and limestone for steel, aggregate and cement for construction, coal for power generation, and more. Those cargoes generate 103,000 jobs with an economic impact of over $20 billion. I will discuss the benefits of marine transportation, the Great Lakes navigation system, our role, the importance of the Jones Act, and maritime infrastructure. As this graphic demonstrates, it takes less energy to move cargo via water. We move a ton of cargo 607 miles from Duluth to Detroit with one gallon of fuel. A truck moves that ton 59 miles per gallon and rail 202. Vessels also emit fewer tons of carbon dioxide per ton mile. Economies of scale help lower energy consumption. One of our Lakers can move 700, I'm sorry, one of our Lakers can move 70,000 tons of cargo, with the, which is the equivalent of 700 rail cars or 3,000 trucks. If trucks operated with vessels efficiency, they could be powered with a lawnmower engine. Prior to the development of the interstate highway system, raw materials, lumber, people, vehicles, and finished goods also moved on Lakers. The higher value, time-sensitive cargoes now moved by faster modes. So low value, heavy cargoes are our focus. Self-unloading vessels can unload in hours, which what once took weeks. This technology and larger vessels combine to make the lakes the world's most efficient system for shipping dry bulk cargo. In fresh water, vessels last decades longer. We maintain our vessels rather than replace them. Last winter, we invested $70 million in maintenance. 
New construction and conversions are also part of our investment plan. Interlake Steamship recently announced the construction of a new laker. Van Inkport Tug and Barge announced the construction of a new laker-sized barge, and Port City Marine Services completed the conversion of a cement barge. The Merchant Marine Act of 1920, the Jones Act, requires that vessels moving cargo between U.S. ports be American-owned, American-built, and American-crewed. This bedrock of maritime policy provides the stability necessary to invest in the fleet. The national, economic, and homeland security benefits and the regulatory certainty it provides allows long-term contracts. The Jones Act encourages Americans to invest huge sums of money in assets that will last decades. It takes more than vessels. The Corps of Engineers will soon begin construction on a new Sioux Lock to add system resiliency. No longer will 11 million Americans be dependent on a single point of failure in northern Michigan. Maintenance of channel depths is also critical. I applaud the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee's efforts to fully spend the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Through your efforts, we have made great strides. We also need adequate and reliable Coast Guard icebreakers on the Great Lakes, but we appear to be losing ground on that front. Because we carry low value cargo, we operate on thin margins. We are sensitive to the cost of regulations. Even high value cargo is sensitive to additional shipping costs, such as the harbor maintenance tax being applied a second time to con containerized imports that move domestically by ship. Cargo is king, and transportation industry evolves to serve its needs. We exploit the laws of physics that make shipping the most efficient, environmentally friendly, and socially responsible mode of transportation. We changed the size of our vessels and invented self-unloading technology. In order to grow the domestic air maritime industry, we need regulatory stability, support the Jones Act, and consider the cost of regulations, infrastructure, dredging, break walls, locks, and icebreakers. And we need system resiliency, a new lock in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Moving low value, heavy commodities is what we do best. We can and want to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weekly. Mr. Willis. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO and our affiliated unions, I want to thank you for inviting us to testify this morning and appreciate the interest of the subcommittee in finding new and innovative ways to grow our, our U.S. Uh, maritime uh, industry. You know, since the nation's beginnings, waterborne freight transportation has been key to moving goods uh, in this country. The mariners, the shipbuilders, the dredgers, the longshore workers represented by TTD's unions, we are on the front lines of this industry and we are fully supportive of the swift deployment of short sea shipping. Better utilizing our marine highways, we can reduce congestion and delays at our major ports, which in turn reduces the strain on the entire freight network. Short sea shipping is also green shipping. It offers a viable freight alternative on vessels that are highly fuel efficient with lower emissions, and this impact is further magnified by cutting idling times and fuel consumption from trucks that service our U.S. seaports. And as noted, it is a particularly effective method of transporting goods that can be challenging to move via other uh, modes of transportation, including oversized and overweight cargoes. But today's hearing, it asks a bigger and I think an important question of how best to rebuild this industry. And we are here to say that we think utilizing our, our marine highway is part of that puzzle. The U.S. maritime sector, this committee knows this, has long suffered due to unfair competition from unscrupulous foreign flagged shippers. These companies, they have no interest in the fair treatment of workers or safe working conditions, let alone employing Americans. But because most short sea shipping would take place between U.S. destinations on vessels that are U.S. flagged by law, it would guarantee thousands of good paying jobs in this country. Jobs, quite frankly, that cannot come quickly enough. 
In times of humanitarian crisis and war, the Department of Defense calls into service commercial mariners and their vessels. Today, the existing pool is inadequate to meet DOD's sea lift needs. The jobs created by short sea shipping, they can close this gap, creating both economic and national security benefits with a single stroke. Furthermore, short sea shipping would breathe new life and uh, into America's shipbuilding industry. Once a point of pride in this country, too many American shipyards struggle to compete with Chinese and Korea shipyards that are heavily and unfairly state subsidized. If we cannot change course on this, we run the real risk of losing our ability to build commercial vehicles in this country, and that should be unacceptable. A steady demand for Jones Act shifts would put this industry and the jobs it is able to support on stable footing. And as short sea shipping generates business for ports of all sizes, it will create jobs on the longshore side, unloading and loading new waterbound cargoes. And I would be remiss if I did not point out that the jobs created in these industries are good jobs. The kind of people, the kind that people can raise families on. Why? Because workers in maritime and related sectors enjoy the benefits of strong union contracts. The policy and commercial benefits of a marine highway system, they're clear to us, and I think you have consensus on that from this panel. But despite this, we have failed as a nation to unlock the potential. We offer several ideas for, for Congress to consider not an all-inclusive list. But we should examine existing programs, like those meant to assist domestic shipbuilding, to determine if they can be modified or applied to support short sea shipping. Grants, federal grants, designed to facilitate marine highway services should be significantly increased. The initial cost of acqu acquiring equipment and infrastructure improvements necessary for short sea shipping can be significant, and federal dollars we think are necessary to reduce this market barrier to entry. But the biggest hindrance to the use of short sea shipping is the double tax imposed under the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. By taxing shippers twice, once when their goods reach a port of entry and, and again when these same exact goods arrive at a secondary port, this law arbitrarily de-incentivized shippers from choosing short sea shipping as a viable method to move their products. We support legislation that will end this double tax and pave the way for marine highway to become an integral part of our freight network. We stand ready to work with this committee on this policy and others that strengthen the U.S. maritime industry, create new jobs, and promise all the economic benefits that short sea shipping we know has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, um, and I'm very interested in the point you ended on, and I'd like to get the perspective of other witnesses as well about the harbor maintenance tax and the, you know, and for people who don't understand, I think you laid it out pretty well, you know, there is a double tax applied to any cargo transshipped uh, to another U.S. port, whether it's domestic or international in its original origin. Uh, how burdensome is the second application of that harbor maintenance tax uh, to the development of short sea shipping? Mr. Nass, Mr. Weekly, Mr. Willis, if you want to expand on that. Um, it's a big issue for many of us on the committee. So when, when we met a couple weeks ago with uh, some beneficial cargo owners and uh, port owners and shippers up and down the East Coast, the biggest part of the discussion was you have to be competitive. Uh, a business is not going to uh, move to a mode of transportation that's more expensive than, than less expensive. I, it's, it's that simple. Uh, so I, I believe any way that, that you can make waterborne transportation uh, more cost effective, more competitive is going to help get this, this program uh, going. And, and I think really what we need to do as, as a nation is recognize that the benefits of, of moving heavy cargo off the road. Uh, the numbers I've heard, 44, 46 cents, uh, uh, damage uh, to a roadway uh, from a heavy box. Uh, I see a win-win here. I, you know, let's spend 10 cents uh, on, on getting that box onto, onto the water. And certainly the, the harbor maintenance tax, the, the notion of, of even, it sounds like a small, money, a small amount for your average person, right? 0.125. Uh, 
Uh, in an industry, though, that where margins are razor thin, and any cost that, that you add to any of it just makes it that much less competitive. Yeah, appreciate that, Mr. Weekland. I don't know if we can get your slide back up. Uh, I thought it was actually uh, pretty compelling, and it doesn't even in, it doesn't even include the point Mr. Nash just made about the external costs of uh, of maintaining those roadways. Right? That's not included in your in your number, right? Correct, sir. That that does not include that external cost of the Harmony Trust Fund. I concur with everything Mr. Nass said as well as Mr. Willis. Um, if I may pick up on a point Congressman Garamendi uh, mentioned, it's not only a disincentive uh, to, to get around the West Coast ports, it's a disincentive for containers to come into the Great Lakes. They're offloaded in Montreal and Quebec. They're put on a rail and they're railed into Detroit, Chicago. I see them crossing the bridges all the time. Um, in the Port of Cleveland, they've come up with an innovative uh, approach to, to subsidize direct uh, container ships on a more uh, liner basis to Europe. Um, I think they've sent, since stopped subsidizing that. It still survives. However, the exact problem we're talking about prevents Cleveland from being a feeder port, a hub and spoke to Europe because of that second domestic move. So it's a challenge for us on the lakes too, sir. Uh, uh, thank you. With that, I'll yield to the gentleman from Ohio, uh, Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, Chairman. I do uh, want to welcome uh, Mr. Weekly because he is a constituent. It's always nice to have a constituent here. Um, I was going to, uh, Mr. Weekly, uh, talk about the uh, Sioux Lock project in your testimony, and I've always been a strong advocate since I'm, my my tenure here is that that should be a national significant importance. I think uh, during World War II, I think we had a brigade up there guarding it. They were so worried about it. Uh, and can you tell us uh, where we are in in the, in the process of getting that uh, redone? So. Uh Congressman, again, I appreciate all your support over the years, particularly uh, your support through this subcommittee. Um, great news on the Sioux Locks. They've developed a positive benefit to cost ratio. The Army Corps, to its credit, and to OMB, to its credit, recognize that this lock is of critical su significance well beyond the, um, the benefit to cost ratio. As you mentioned, there were 10,000 troops up there. In FY19, we got $32.3 million out of the work plan. Um, the president's budget proposed 75.3. I think it should be, I think it just passed. Was that one of the things you were just voting on on the omnibus? Um, so we're hoping that'll go forward. Um, the project is well underway and the state of Michigan kicked in $52 million towards that project. So I, I am not an optimist by nature, sir, but I'm convinced this project's gonna go forward. Well, one thing I'll just uh, reminisce here a little bit when I was chairman of the Water Resource Development Committee, uh, Secretary Darcy at the time, we we're talking about the cost benefit schedule, uh, uh, plan, uh, uh, you know, analysis. And I said to her, I think we can do this here in 15 minutes, me and you, and get it done. So I'm glad to see it's finally moving because it seemed like to me it was a no brainer. Uh, I, I made to, sir, I should also thank this committee for reauthorizing it in word of 20, uh, 2018. So thank you for that, sir. Um, go back to the, uh, the Harvard Maintenance Trust Fund fee, the 0.0125%. That, uh, it doesn't sound like a lot of money. Uh, but I want to, you know, it's interesting, all three of you in the testimony in that, because if you have a million dollars worth of cargo, it's 1250 bucks. You get charged once, and you get charged twice, so, you know, 2500 bucks Doesn't sound like a whole lot of money for a big ship if it's a million dollars of cargo. But, but uh, your, your competition doesn't have that, that's what you're saying. And then you also got the challenge, uh, you're limited where you can move because where the water is, and I'm glad to hear you say about how how much improvement's been made in the infrastructure and lo unloading and loading, uh, because when that vessel is sitting there, that's time, that's money, right? And I know when I was over at the Shanghai port in China, I was, uh, I was unbelievably hurt when they told us how fast they're turning those ships around. It was sometimes less than 24 hours or 36 hours, I guess, depending on the tide. So that's amazing, all those containers. And I know, I, I know in Cleveland we've had this discussion that you're trying to do that in the containers. So, um, I guess the point I'm just trying to make to emphasize, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but the, when you got the competition with rail and truck and, and their ability to move that cargo to point A to point B, the faster route to, to, the, to the end con, uh, customer, that's really what it's really, it's factors in and makes it negative for you. Is, is that correct, right? Yes, sir, I would agree. Um, also time value of money, our ships are moving slower yeah. through the water than they are over the road. So we have to make that up by handling point and by economies of scale. So I'll defer to Mr. Nast. Absolutely, uh, efficiency at, at the dock is, is the name of the game. Uh, that ship's only making money uh, when, when it's moving. 
Uh, I just could, just thought that came to my head here. Going back from currently, going back 10 years or so, what are we, how much change in efficiency at the dock would you estimate we've picked up? Uh, well, sir, in our instance, we didn't exist uh, 10 oh, years ago. Okay. You're 100% uh, then. Okay. So, so my, my time frame is, is five years. Okay. And uh, we were the recipient of a fast lane grant uh, that, that brought in some, some new machinery. And, and we really struggled at about 10 moves an hour uh, when we first started uh, five years ago. Uh, with a new vessel, with a new crane, with a great labor force that's getting better and better every day, uh, we're up to 23 moves an hour. Uh, that makes a big difference. It means yeah. the ship is leaving in a day and not well, two a days. double efficiency. That's good. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Weekly, just quickly, I talked about the ice uh, cutters on the on the Great Lakes. You want to just complain about the importance of that? I'm having I'm, I'm meeting with the commandant tomorrow night. I thought maybe that might be good to get some more information on that. Well, sir, with with uh, chairman's permission, I'll provide some more detailed information for the record. But I can tell you, in the winter of 20 or 13, 14. We left 6.8 million tons on the dock because of inadequate ice breaking. That cost the U.S. economy 3,800 jobs and 70, $705 million in lost economic activity because of inadequate ice breaking. The winter of 14-15, similar numbers, 3.2 million tons, 2,000 jobs, $355 million uh, in lost economic activity. The reliability is abysmal. Um, this year, four of their nine icebreakers were out of commission. Last winter, five of their nine icebreakers simultaneously inoperable. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. You bet. Uh, thank the gentleman. One bit of housekeeping without objection. I'd ask unanimous consent to also include um, a statement by Mr. Percy Pine of Green Shipping Line into the record. Uh, Mr. Garamendi. Did somebody mention icebreakers? I just wrote down the two numbers here, 705 million and 365, is that correct? Um, 705 million and 355, sir. A uh, super heavy icebreaker runs about 700 million, a copy, and that's not for the Great Lakes, that's for the Arctic. Just keep in mind the relative costs and the benefits associated with icebreakers. Thank you for mentioning it. This committee's been super on that issue. Um, we've talked about the double taxation here, which seems to be a, maybe not the only issue, but a significant issue. Uh, we need to get down to the numbers on the potential revenue uh, that is lost currently uh, and the economic activity that could be gained were there no double taxation. So if you gentlemen could help us with that analysis, it would be very useful. My sense of it is that there's not much tax loss now should we eliminate the double taxation. But we're going to have to score that, and uh, if there's a tax bill ever, then we'd want to have this in it. So we'd want to have that kind of detailed information if you could uh, develop that. Um, also, there's another way of going about it, and you mentioned Cleveland, and that Cleveland um, essentially rebated that tax. Once again, uh, numbers would be useful here. Uh, we have the uh, annual appropriation of $7 million, $10 million, whatever, uh, for the uh, marine highway system, and um, just thinking of different ways we can get this job done. Uh, on the tax side, you can sub, you can rebate. We could appropriate the money and then it gets rebated or we can eliminate the tax. So once again, numbers would be very useful for that. Uh, also, um, the efficiency of loading and unloading, which is said to be a problem. Appreciate your testimony on the efficiency that you've achieved in Maine. But this may be an infrastructure problem on the ports and the docks themselves. Uh, so I'd like to get uh, some detail on that. What are we talking about? There's one example in the written testimony here of a, of a method that did that. Uh, so if you could just discuss those things, if, if you have the numbers, if you have the if, what it takes to make the dock efficient for this purpose. Whichever one of you wants to jump in. Uh, 
maybe I could touch on the infrastructure end of it. Uh, we've invested about $64 million uh, into our relatively small terminal. Uh, much of that it revolves around being more efficient. Uh, for instance, uh, our maintenance facility was on the pier when, when we started. Uh, the wrecking balls are coming today. Uh, we built a new maintenance facility out of the way. Um, and the, the entire notion is to create that ship to shore uh, space that just makes it more efficient to, to unload a vessel. Uh, similarly, we've expanded our pier space uh, and, and put, put new equipment on there, and uh, it pays off. Uh, the ROI on this uh, it, you know, is, is a matter of years when the infrastructure lasts uh, an awful long time. Our oldest crane is over 20 years old, and, and she's still working, working great. We think it's worth the investment. Is there a specialty issue here also, the kind of equipment that you need to take from perhaps not in Maine, but any of the major docks uh, and ports, uh, East Coast, West Coast, coming off a big um, big ship, putting it on a small vessel or a tug, or excuse me, a barge? We're talking about different kinds of infrastructure that would be needed. I think the equipment we have at the International Marine Terminal in Portland is the same type of equipment you would use for barge operations, mobile harbor cranes, reach stackers, uh, that, those types of items. Very good. One of the things we did a couple of years ago was to allow the Harbor Maintenance Fund to be used for on-the-dock improvements, uh, which has really not been used very much. Uh, my final point would be a question for, uh, for us to try to get into, and that is, and I did not ask this of, uh, General, of Admiral Busby, what are the specific projects that are lined up? What we have now created is what I call administrative earmarks. I want to know what his earmarks are, so if we can dig that out and see how they fit into the testimony and the priorities that you've mentioned. With that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate what I sense to be the bipartisan love of icebreakers on this committee. I'd like to probe the depths of that a little bit more, um, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here, for being patient with our schedule, and thank you, Mr. Weekly, for your um, uh, eloquent testimony to the importance of the Great Lakes, and I uh, represent Green Bay, Wisconsin, and that's obviously critical to our economic success. Uh, the Port of Green Bay in particular is an essential part of maritime trade. We have over 166 vessels, arrive, uh, vessel arrivals that generate 147 million in economic impact in the region. As you mentioned, we move everything from iron ore to Wisconsin soy, but ultimately that trade is dependent on shipping lanes on the Great Lakes being open. And in the wintertime, that means icebreakers. Um, gets cold in my neck of the woods. In case anyone was wondering. Um, so the Coast Guard right now operates 12 icebreakers that are in high demand for a quarter of the year, but only one of these, the Mackinac, is of medium size and was intended to work in a pair, meaning that it must cut backwards on each shipping lane without a second Mackinac. So last month I questioned, and we had a great dialogue on this committee, uh, I questioned Admiral Schultz uh, from the Coast Guard on the need for a new icebreaker for the Great Lakes, and I know you've already talked about the economic impact, um, but in your testimony, you mentioned that we're losing ground, you sort of briefly mentioned that we're losing ground with respect to U.S. Coast Guard Great Lakes ice breaking, and I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of explain and expand, expound upon that comment. Uh, so I'll focus on two areas, the 140s and the need for the new MAC. So the 140s are going through their service life ex uh, extension program, or the SLEP. The biggest problem with that SLEP program is they're not replacing the engines. Those engines are 30 to 40 years old. They're very expensive mm -hmm. to maintain. They're very finicky. You, they could have put a brand new tier four, state of the art, lower energy, lower pollution, more reliable engine with a reliable uh, inventory of, of spare parts in the commercial industry. That would have streamlined it. In fact, the Morro Bay, one of the ships that was out of, for a, a month, was out of commission for a month, and it's a post-slap. The uh, Biscayne Bay, 16 months out of commission because of an engine casualty. It took them eight months to build the ship. It took them 16 months to fix an engine repair. As a former Coast Guard officer I, I, and a former engineer in the Coast Guard, I find that somewhat frustrating. Uh, the Mackinac, as you mentioned, it's, it's basically a single point of failure. 
If the, if the Mighty Mac goes down, we're not going to open Sturgeon Bay. We're not going to open our, our shipyards to get them out of layup. We're not going to get through uh, Lake Superior. Um, the original plan was to build two Mackinaws. Uh, they cut that. Um, I think there's a suggestion of combining it with the polar program. The, the problem I see with that, sir, is that uh, we it would waste a hundred million dollars, you know, to build a polar class icebreaker for the Great Lakes. We need a second max size. Um, we don't need a polar. The ice conditions are different. Um, there are different styles of ice, and it's different operation. We need more maneuverability than they need in, in the uh, in the Arctic. Um, the uh, old Mac was a heavier, wider, did a better job to handle our 1,000-footers. The new Mac is new, more maneuverable, but it, but it need, needed the second. The original plan, had they stuck with it, would have worked. Unfortunately, cost-cutting uh, has a cost to us. And so you, to the you, you mentioned the Mac as a single point of failure and that we'd have to shut down Sturgeon Bay, et cetera. Would, is it even possible to quantify the economic impact in such a scenario? Um, well, the best... I, the best I could do was the 14, 15 numbers I would give you, um, but really it would be catastrophic. There's no way to measure the cost of shutting down a steel mill. I think they estimated it would be $100 million because if you do a cold shutdown that's not planned, yeah. you have to reline the steel mill. It would be catastrophic to the steel mills of Indiana. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I yield back and we gotta break the ice. Thank the gentleman um, for that bipartisan note of consensus. Um, don't see any further questions on the committee. Uh, I know we have kept you gentlemen um, uh, well past uh, the time you probably expected, so uh, in, the, in the interest of respecting everyone's schedule, I'd like to thank all of you for your testimony. Um, your contribution to today's discussion has been very informative and helpful. I'd ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing. Further ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. That objection so ordered. If no other members have anything to add, uh, with thanks to our, our panelists, uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.